This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, another big episode back for the end of May. And we have 63 new campaigns. There are so many that in the middle of this I may have to stop, just as a heads up. Uh, because Kickstarter won't let me open any more pages because there's just so much that has to get loaded in order to see everything. So that's an interesting one. They kind of do it all the time, but now they seems to be like they're really uh, being a hard ass about it. So we'll see where it goes. I spent my holiday weekend of Memorial Day weekend at GameX 2022. And that it was at the Los Angeles Airport Hilton. And it was a lot of fun. Played a lot of Munchkin. I uh, got to play some Monster Slaughter with friends and also CIA Collect Them All, or sorry, CIA Collection Deck, which is a Kickstarter game you should check out. I believe they released the PDFs if you want to do a print and play, and it's pretty fun. It's based on the collection. Uh, it was something to do with the games that they do in the CIA in order to train people to like catch El Chapo. It has something to do with that, so... It's a neat deal. Uh, like I said, collection deck. CIA collection deck. That's the one. And yeah, I didn't think I'd get to do any LARPing or any RPG stuff. But, you know, we spent most of the time just playing Cthulhu versions of Munchkin. And that was fun. Good to hang out with friends for a couple of days. And uh, eat hotel food. So that was fun. Um, yeah, we'll see what's going on. First up in the board game column is Lift. And it is a game about ants. And as you can see, it has a terrible name because the name doesn't say anything to do with ants. Anything can be lifted. Makes you think more about gravity. Uh, if it wasn't an ant on the cover, even though there is an ant on the cover, it might uh, confuse you. So I think that might be um, part of the problem. And the other thing is, you see how this here? I don't like this. Let me click on this so you can see my cursor. You, ha you just put your first name. A lot of people did that this week. Don't do that unless you have one name like Madonna or Cher put your real name <laughs> whatever you want it to be if it's the company name or whatever nobody's going to trust you if you're not willing to put your whole name on it now you can click on it and then see oh that's the guy's real name but don't do that i mean you're not you're not really selling the game that way don't don't do that um there isn't a lot of information as to how the game runs seems to be something about stealing resources and the cards themselves have a lot of negative space. And that's not a really good aesthetic compared to the other things that are out there. So I think those are the things that need to be addressed on this game for it to hit that $5,000 mark. Which is kind of rough. Um, it probably needs some more time with an art budget. And uh, uh, definitely a uh, name change. Then we have a code breaking game called Cardle. Which is about people competing to break codes and um, yeah so you can see there's different categories and how it all breaks down I am not as into cryptography and that kind of stuff as the really crazy individuals are uh, it does offer head-to-head -head and team play which is kind of neat in order to do the the code breaking but I don't know exactly how well um, this is going to be set up how difficult it is or how accessible it is and you can check it out if you're into code breaking then we got a dice roller but this time it's about jazz and jazz musicians so it's called the gig the dice rolling jazz game and one of four players it takes about 20 minutes to play you get to uh, choose instruments and as you can see that's how the song breaks down is depending on what you have in your dice areas and that's neat I don't particularly like these kind of dice games. Uh, the one that I have is Pulp Detective, and it plays very similarly. I know a lot of people do. It just wasn't my thing. Um, but it is an interesting theme, and I like that they're branching out into something that uh, you could play jazz music at the same time as you're playing the game, and it won't interfere, and you can really set an ambiance to it. So I like that idea. Then we have Sare, I think. Um, it is not sorry. It is a game about Egypt. Two to four players, so no solo mode, uh, unless they release some type of uh, expansion. And as we can try to find some components here to show you, it's got its own little pyramid board with different pieces for you to be able to see. And as you can see, they have a, a nice uh, 
Valley of the Kings style uh, card holder thing, which is kind of neat. Um, you got different Egyptian things. You can play it on Tabletopia. With Moon Knight coming out and having a lot with uh, all the Egyptian gods and stuff, I think this is a, a great time uh, to try to produce this type of content. It's kind of neat. Ankh and a few other competitors do exist, but this one is uh, neat that it's offering the 3D buildings and all the obelisks and that kind of cool stuff. So if you want a 4X style strategy game, then uh, maybe this will work for you. It's got push your luck and some other uh, neat uh, things to throw in with it. It's all on GameFound. Then we have Primordial about indigenous cultures, and that's neat and all, unfortunately. See that $50,000? Well, let's see if we can show you why it's not making it. Well, is it the box? No, box looks cool. We've got a card, and it says it's created by somebody, uh, but not what they've done. It says they are good at something, but not necessarily a breakdown of the past things that they've created. And another card, and that's it. Okay, it's a card game. We're only going to show you two cards. And we're just going to describe things. We're not going to show you how it plays. We're just going to put a bunch of blocks of words. That is not the way to entice people to buy your game. It has everything else probably going for it. There's lots of neat things there. It says it's breathtakingly simple gameplay. Well, if it's so simple, why can't you show it? You understand? Powerful imagery. But you're only going to show two of the cards. It's just not living up to what it's promising. And if it did, I think it would hit some numbers. But it needs to bring that price down to closer to around 10 Unless the art budget was so high that they needed it to be up to 50000 then they need to show off that art so that people will want to have it and can see that that's the product that they're going to be getting. And uh, if they're doing a lot of tell, not show, people don't show their cash. We have Court, the royally clever game, three to five players. It's only 15 bucks, which is kind of neat and plays in 30 minutes. And, I mean, this one just shows off cards. So you get the backs of the cards look neat, and then you got the fronts of the cards for the suits. There are only three suits in this one, so you can't use it necessarily as a poker deck unless you somehow swapped it out. Uh, or the weirdest game of poker you ever played. Only 10 cards instead of 13. And you're trying to find, uh, I think, higher levels of points to in order to win each uh, sets of hands as you play through it so interesting um but i think maybe it would have i really have to hear why it can't just be used with uh the 13 and 4 suits seems like you'd be able to add more players maybe it's to make it faster uh that would be interesting but you can't use it as a regular playing deck which would be extra versatility Next, we're looking at Thornraver Batter for Battle for Solace, strategic area control, leading a horde across a continent vying for power. And uh, let's see if you can see with the different types of artwork here. You got a little bit of that um, skyship steampunk kind of look, different, uh, maybe even cyberpunk kind of characters. So neat. It looks like a map of North America and uh, some pretty decent pieces of artwork like i say they covers a wide variety of uh, genres and different types of uh, characters so that part is pretty neat you can play test it if you want check out the different uh, things that go along with it um yeah if any of those ideas sound good if the art looks good give it a quick glance and see if it's your type of game for area control like i said of various parts of north america in some weird far-flung future then we have another one that seems pretty cute, but is uh, problematic in their implementation of the page. It's a Desiring Curse Intertwined. Um, yeah, it's it's a Gate of Desire. First off, put the name first. Gate of Desire. <laughs> then all the extra stuff. Um, okay. It's got all these unlocked items that they say, but what is the game? It doesn't tell you. You got to come down here and okay there's a little cartoon that's kind of neat all right this should have been the first thing to see it's a one to five player game one to eight hours really 16 and older you can't play it with kids so who's buying it all right story background can you read that um 
You probably can't because I'm having a hard time with it. It's so dense and everything, and the, the pages don't scale, especially since this is a graphic. It, it doesn't scale to be able to see it bigger. <laughs> if you're on a phone, if you're on you know anything, you, you, you're not gonna be able to read the damn page. Um, there's some cards that have uh, different, looks like they stack or are created in some type of anime style. Um, if you're into that, great. I don't know, it makes it 16 plus. And it seems to have some type of uh, tactics, maybe based game. There's like Final Fantasy Tactics. That seemed to be what this game reminds me of the most. But all of this little tiny text that you can't expand is a terrible, terrible idea. Poor page layout. I'm surprised they made it this far. But only eight people. Maybe they got some friends in it spending uh, over 100 bucks a piece. Good luck to them. Uh, for me, I'd be out the second I didn't see what the heck the game is about and everything's kind of all over the place because I don't feel like I could trust the company to make a game that's easy for me to understand and play if they can't even handle the page. So the page is an important piece. Death by Coconut seems pretty simple, but it tells you right what it is. It is a betting race of risk and reward and you're trying to get to the finish line uh, with skeletons. So... Um, that's kind of neat. Obviously, you're going to have to have somebody to race against, so it's two to eight players, but it's 30 minutes. You can play with some kids, 10 and up, and uh, you can see it flopping around and making its way around. The, you don't always have to have animated graphics, but you know it does explain what the game is pretty quickly. You get surf skeletons, you get the coconut chips, you get treasure. If that seems like fun, then buy it for you and your, your, your children in your life and have a good time. Then we have Heroes and Wizards, two to five players, and you're going on epic quest full of cards. So it has a, a very, uh, um, it's not quite video game because it's not an 8-bit uh, setting, but it has that almost chibi style of, uh, of artwork, which is appealing. Each one of these cards looks different. Remember when I was talking before about how the negative space, when they were just white cards? Well, if you have the negative space here that has extra art colors and things like that, that makes it work uh it makes each um card feel different stand out like it's easy to explain then that part is really helpful you're going to create uh your party with the same basic rpg type stuff steal enchant and figure out your quest so it's a an rpg light done in a chibi style that feels like a video game and none of those are bad things so as long as it's done right Shovel Knight, uh, same kind of thing, reminds me of that uh, style of artwork. So if you need more of it, check it out. Otherwise, I guess one deck dungeon, things like that, maybe for more your style. Same kind of fantasy feel, but in a whole different way, more of a boondock style of artwork. We have the Amulet of Therax. This is an area control game that has a, that fantasy style of feel. You can see you have a city area and you're going to be making your way around there. You are creating cults, always fun, and uh, making your way with different characters. I like that they have like the Thieves Guild style and uh, other different weirdos and things that you can put together. Almost looks like a political cartoon in the, uh, the sense of how it's created and represents different classes. So that's fun, uh, making your way through the various city parts taken over and uh, I guess avoiding the plague. Trolls and Rerolls, I like the name of their company name as well. There's lots of thought put into that. It tells you exactly the kind of people that you're dealing with. And uh, I like that, being upfront about things. And we have another one that probably bit off a little more than it could chew with this $44,000 um, demand, but it, this Book of Skulls for fantasy boards, games, and heavy metal music there is a group of uh, individuals that is pretty large that does board gaming, RPG gaming, all of those things. It's the right kind of feel and the right kind of people to get. Um, however, to have that kind of money, you usually need miniatures. And this has more of a standees kind of feel. Two to four players. You get different types of maps. Slayers versus Slayers, if you wanted to be that. Um... So I guess PvP, PvE, all together. Uh, different neat things. It's a pretty busy 
So I would like a little more explanation on how the the game functions. See how all those board, there's a lot going on there as far as uh, the the pictures and all that. And it seems to be like, if you can take a look here, this pink and yellow, it looks like they're trying to maybe uh, evoke some Mork Boy uh, feel and bring people into it. Uh, that's not a bad thing. Again, that's part of the same group of folks that would enjoy a little heavy metal and uh, board gaming and RPG gaming in their life. So I think maybe they just need to get in front of the right people. But really, uh, I don't see any components that make it look like it has to be so expensive. Uh, I don't see anything as far as the components that they couldn't get printed even on demand. So um, I would hope they can bring this down or offer something that will bring the um, the reason for buying higher so that more people can jump in. A lot of the things, even more boy, um, it takes a while to build an audience, just making little wins over and over and over again until you, uh, can get in, you know, an established group of, uh, fans. So, uh, maybe tie in with those folks, give Philip Reed a call. Not really sure. Maybe that'll help you. Same kind of feel, same kind of problem. Crypto dome, it feels like a 80s version of a video game um, of the same kind of setup of, uh, you know, uh, violence on a board. <laughs> Way too high a, of a asking price. And you can play it for free on Tabletop Simulator if you wanted to do that and see if it's the type of game that you want. It's, it's got a lot more sci-fi aspects to it. Um, yeah, crazy, uh, I guess, lava Lava Knot, I guess is what you'd be if you're running through this game. I mentioned Shovel Knight before. This is a different roguelike. Deathly Thrones, 52 playing cards and a quest booklet. So you can see all this black and white artwork that you can print and play yourself. One of the cool things about being 52 cards, if it is print and play, if you did take it to make playing cards, that is the highest efficiency price uh, per card is to do decks of 52, so that part's kind of nice. You have different counters, and the booklet tells you different deals. And uh, see how it met the goal and exceeded the goal and has a lot of backers. It didn't go over the um, the ask. So and some of these other ones, that the game pricing is too high. If it's your first time in, maybe try this print and play method and bring your cost way, way down. And then on the next round, you can get a printed version when uh, it makes more sense and you get more people involved in it. Then we have a basketball game. There's been a few in the past, and some of them will have boards and that have a, a actual basketball hoop and things on it. Some of it's just about uh, working the teams. This seems to have uh, a different approach to it. Almost like Gamelin Games. The tiny epic stuff. So if this was like tiny epic basketball, <laughs> I'm trying to find the, you know, the, these little, little uh, basketball courts that you would play on. It's kind of neat. Different characters, uh, different cards. Doesn't seem like it's based on real people or anything like that, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, one to five players. So there's a, slow, a solo mode if you wanted to try that, and uh, you know maybe it will help you coach basketball not really sure and uh, Arden uh, Prime Minister Arden has been around uh, the US lately from New Zealand and uh, she hasn't been bringing any bugs with her but she could if you want to bring this game insects so it's all about the bugs of New Zealand and it's a print and play roll and draw simple easy game uh, to make for yourself and I guess you're doing paths there other weird, neat things that you might find. New Zealand's got all kinds of stuff. Got whatever biome you want in such a tiny place. So more power to them. Maybe find uh, oh, Wellycon. I'm not really sure what that is, but okay, if they're if they're offering that up too. So neat little game about bugs, paths, and uh, all you need is to be able to, I guess, order the dice or uh, print it yourself. Now we get into some really cool things as far as the concept. This is Unsolved Science. It is a escape room of science. 
And that's one of the cool things that people might not really think about when it comes to science. Science is repeatable. Science has a path. If you follow the steps every time exactly, you will have the exact same outcome. That's what makes it science. <laughs> so that's what makes it uh, real and good science is that you were able to repeat it. If you can't repeat it, the same experiment over and over and over again, forwards or backwards, if you can't repeat it perfectly, you're doing bad science. So what it does is it allows you to create the same concept of an escape room because you have all the different points that are in a path. Once you find the right path, you come out to the right outcome. And that makes it really neat. So it says here you can also use um, real experimentation. So I don't know if there's any chemicals involved. It looks like they give you some litmus paper Maybe you can make that part function and some other types of graphs and pieces. So, I mean, yeah, is it going to feel like science class? Of course it will. But it also might feel like a lot of fun. And one of the most interesting room escapes that you could play. I mean, uh, it's not that much different, if it's different at all, than the detect detective games. It's just a different kind of feel to go with it. So... Uh, 42 bucks if you want to give it a shot and enamel pins come with it I don't know music tracks that's fine but I don't care about enamel pins at all um, but maybe there'll be more of these in the future and you can make it seem less like a game and more like homework or the other way around then we have a game that is asking for a quarter million dollars and might get it um, it's almost there and it's only first couple days in or first day in, but it's Batman themed. This is an escape room with app integration, uses AR. It has uh, cardboard terrain. So you basically go out and create Gotham city as you move across, it has lots of physical pieces that are expensive that have to go with it, but you also have to have a tablet or a phone up all the time. Um, it is going to have all these different puzzles, like an escape room. It's going to have these Halloween mask things, if you uh, are into that kind of deal. And it is going to have a price tag to boot. So you can start it for two, almost 200 bucks. Um, but if you're going to get uh, the second version, I guess, there's multiple episodes. They're like 200 bucks a piece. It's very expensive because there's lots of pieces of art. There's lots of... Um, Lots of things going on. Um, the people behind it, they've made some other... Uh, this is the first time on Kickstarter, but they've made some other games. The app integration is expensive. All the physical pieces, expensive. That goes on to you. I don't know if it's going to make it to a store <laughs> ever at that price tag. But if you wanted to run and play a Gotham-based um, game where the Joker is coming after you and it's got all this cool 3D stuff and you don't mind holding up your phone all the time, then maybe this is the thing you've been waiting for. For me, I'm going to stick with Monolith for right now. But uh, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Then we moved on to the miniatures games. This one is Heroes of the Old World in the End Dead Court of the Dwarf Lord. I think it's more of a skirmish type game. And... Uh, you can see you get different miniatures and things to go along with that. So different characters. I'm sure you have to paint them yourself. But um, yeah, if you've been looking for more of a skirmish game than uh, weird vultures and things like that, then maybe give this one a shot. Similarly, miniatures game RuneScape Kingdoms, one to five players. And I don't know the RuneScape world, but maybe that's the... Uh, selling point here um, as you can see fantasy type minis and other fun things to go along with it and steam forged games i guess is part of uh, well the publisher for this the the development so if you like them you like what they got going on uh maybe give this a go uh, it seems like an rpg like a, a, a simplified version of an rpg this guy looks modern, brought into um, a fantasy world. Steamforge, like I said, has created 
lots of different things from in the past. That's why they're able to get such high numbers. Uh, minis wise, they look pretty good. They're not blowing me away, but they're pretty good. And uh, if you just need another cooperative game, because the other ones are running out, or you just like Steamforge, give us one uh, a glance. I do not know how to pronounce this. Par teotates, par tutates, par whatever. It's a uh, Gallic army, 10 to 28 millimeters, depending on your army. Did I see 15 at the top? Yeah. Also, you can get 15 millimeter scale, I guess. There we go. Chariots, um, spearmen, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, looks like there's a few horses and people you can swap out. You know if you're playing um, this uh, this type of war game and need it. So, figured it put it all there for you. Franco-Prussian War, the other one, 1864. Da-da-da-da-da, uh, there we go. It's 3D printable terrain and other pieces for uh, that time period. So if uh, you're in need of those for your gaming, cool. You get to play it. When I was at GameX, they had all kinds of people playing uh, upstairs uh, war games, having a really good time. Some playing Axis of Allies, some playing pre-released content, all different theaters, all different styles um, of people playing stuff. So it seemed to be pretty popular, people having a good time. So if you need some terrain to go along with yours, then this is where you'd go. We have a hex, hex crawl now. Uh, this is the RPG side. Basilisk Hills. And yeah, Todd Lebeck. Again, put your whole damn name. You're not the only Todd. Um, and uh, just a breakdown of different things. Troglodytes, plateaus, uh, gangrenous orcs. If you need that kind of adventure uh, and you want to do it with hexes. Talked about Morg Boy before. Here it is, Morg Boy, adventure in hardcover, growing menace, and this is, you know, if you haven't seen it before, it takes place during the apocalypse. The world is breaking down. Everything is screwed up. Um, it's, I think, OSR based and compatible. So this one is going to be print on demand. Tom Wilson's created a bunch of other pieces in the past for various games and uh, you can find more here same thing more boy now we have cyborg this is the sci-fi version of it still in the apocalypse but now with cyberpunk and it's all this you know uh, crazy high contrast artwork it's like a uh, color vomit at the same time and you know just a, a neat style that goes along with it if you like the grim, dark, horrible uh, feel of what you find in Morgue Boy, then maybe Cyborg taking it to the far future is one, another way to go about that. I don't think it's going to be that far before we have to deal with uh, Cyborgs ourselves. Because the medical advances are getting pretty far, but uh, you know you get a head start. Then from the Grinning Frog, we have the Ballad of Sir Redmain. And even though it says it's for three to fifth level characters, uh, it warns you that it's supposed to be for experienced art, uh, GMs only. It is from the Any Award winning Stephen Hart. And I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's different themes. Um, it's laid out a little bit differently than other games. Grinning Frog has made 5e stuff uh, in the past, quite a bit of it. So I'm not really sure what the um, the challenge is. Maybe it's the NPCs and then the um, the things that are available um, as options. But if you've been looking for a challenge for your players, even though it's a lower level, that uh, will challenge you as well. Maybe you give this a quick look and see if it's what you're looking for. And then we have El Earldom of Gar. I think it's supposed to be Earldom. And it's supposed to have four different adventure books. Um, not a lot of information. Looks like it happens to be uh, it's something about Britannia game design. So maybe it has um, a lot going on there. Chivalry and Sorcery is the uh, system. I don't see that come up very often. 
but uh, maybe it has something special to do with the land of England. Um, but yeah, maybe give this a, a look if you're playing chivalry and sorcery. Seems like there's a fair amount of people that are. Um, but yeah, just not one that I hear of much for Kickstarter. The one that you always hear about is 5e. So here it is. This is Tomes of Terror, creating dreadful atmosphere and horror. So I'm going to guess if you're playing in Ravenloft, this will work out pretty well. And um, you can get lots of different horror ideas, which is great. Different mechanics. Uh, so there's some diseases and things later on in the episode uh, that you can include. You get a different type of weird tarot deck. And you can see all these different uh, crazy looking creatures. If you got inspired by the latest installment of uh, Stranger Things to go in a more horror direction, this will help you. There's an Inquisitor. And it says Templar, but I mean... I'll have to look into it. <laughs> I'm not, I don't see much Templar related that I would understand, but maybe it's a whole different thing. Different liches, undead, all kinds of cool stuff thrown in as well. As I said, probably good if you have Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. You can include a lot of these interesting concepts to go with it. And if you instead just need some creatures, the Endless Realms has over 240 of them. Keeping in mind that they just um, got rid of uh, support for Volo's Guide to Monsters in favor of uh, the multiverse stuff, maybe you will need some new creatures to go along with it and uh, inspire you. If you don't like the current ones or you want to stick with Volo's Guide, then maybe these backwards compatible uh, homebrews will uh, be more exciting for you. And uh, it comes with VTT tokens and things like that that you can use in your various games. Uh, very colorful, interesting deals. Um, but the thing with monsters is it's got to scare you. It's got to grab you. It's got to be something of interest to you. And you just have to kind of search through the different tomes of bestiaries to find the ones that fulfill that. A lot of people have issues with players showing up. The Adventurers Agency is hoping to help with that. That's not to force your players into always being at the table, but instead to build it into the story about how to deal with them being absent. Great idea. Solving a problem that people have that prevents people from getting the best out of their gaming. If you pick this up, maybe it will help you get some ideas on how to deal with unreliable players and still have a good time. Uh, drop-ins, drop-outs. I mean, I know Adventures League has some one-shots and things built into it um, that allows you to just jump in and play whenever you can. Um, but yeah, feels a little bit like uh, Acquisitions Incorporated in the sense that you're going to have an agency set up and um, then uh, Acquisitions Incorporated, you have a corporation set up. Um, but both kind of fit. You get some dice and maps and other things like that to go along with it. Uh, GM screens, okay. Different tables. Um, some minis and things you can add on. Kind of a neat deal. Not terribly expensive. Just 25 bucks to get started. And uh, like I said, it could help a lot of people at a lot of tables deal with the frustration of having a missing player. So just build it into the game. Then you won't be frustrated. I happened to see a bunch of advertising for uh, Pride stuff since June 1st ticked over to midnight while I'm recording this. And I guess that's what this is for. This is a Quiro, which I guess is a gay or sh uh, lesbian or one of the other letters, hero thrown into it. Uh, I don't think it has to be specifically a particular uh, flavor of that uh, identity. So... If you have a person in your life that maybe it doesn't feel included, you can bring them in. Uh, it says it has three subclasses, Cleric, Ranger, and Barbarian. I'm not sure how that all works in um, with the gender identity, but hey, maybe it'll help you create more stories. If you already are playing with gay characters in your stories um, or LGBTQ characters in your stories, then uh, maybe you can bring more in. It says there's a diva goddess, which is maybe like a drag queen cleric, um, the denizen conclave, and uh, which is about respecting everyone, her rangers, okay? And then the unsavory environments of the path of the brawler. 
Um, okay, neat ideas. Uh, gay representation is a big deal, especially in uh, tabletop gaming. Even at the convention, there's big tables for people selling stuff uh, specifically with that, uh, you know, in mind and promoting the idea of inclusion and all that for different identities. So, yeah, I expect to see a lot more through the month as we continue. Then for Worlds Without Number, we have the Atlas of the Latter Earth. This is a gazetteer of a fantastic future, and you can see the different art and stuff to go along with it. Um, different timelines, different nations, different classes, optional rules for uh, different levels of magic settings. If you have low or no magic to go along with it. I think, speaking of the multiverse, I think that's what Worlds Without Number uh, goes from. Or it is a type of planet uh, exploration thing. So, that says Scene and Nomine. And I don't know. You can go to the different web store. Uh, they have been pretty popular whenever I've seen this Worlds Without Number uh, RPG stuff pop in. So um, it's uh, obviously offering something new and different that 5e isn't getting you. Then we move on to urban role playing in the grim dark setting, consequence heavy mechanics. Oh no. See, I was telling you, like, Kickstarter was acting weird. All right, Soul Muppet Publishing. There we go. And, uh, yeah, it's just like Mork Boy in the sense that uh, it's supposed to be about something that is not easy for the people living there. It's all dark and terrible. But you have uh, technomancers and things like that, so it has a little bit that steampunk. Not steampunk. What am I trying to say? Cyberpunk uh, feel to it, especially if you read Neuromancer, um, then maybe a lot of these characters would seem familiar. That uh, seems to be kind of the point of having weird AIs and all that kind of stuff. It seems to be uh, best left buried, maybe, is the system for this. And we have a 5e adventure, Guardians of Agthor, and um, you can check out the various art and things to go along with it. There are a few other campaigns previous to this one that they feel like they've been successful at which is great um you can see uh yeah you get your own terrible version of the raccoon like from guardians of the galaxy <laughs> uh kraken of your own and other neat things to go along with it it seems like they've they've got a built-in fan base and different companion books to go along with it so i'm running out of steam and I have many, many, many more to go. So I'll let you check it out. Uh, you can see the various uh, pieces that make this new for a familiar setting. Then uh, one of the things I always see from like Nerd Immersion and the other D&D channels is a need for magic items. So that's what Incredible Items is trying to give you. You can get a free download. It tells you a few of the different items that they're putting out there. You can see the type of artwork. It's neat. Different ideas thrown in and out. If uh, you need more inspiration, then, you know, give them a, a quick look. And I said before that there was more stuff about injuries. Well, here you go. Injuries and vile deeds. This is an injury system with 200 character options. Um, yeah, I mean, if you take the idea of getting hit by a dragon, you're probably going to have some lasting effects. Even if magic is involved, it might take a while to heal. And there's some... Ideas that were in Unearthed Arcanas that Mike Merles had really early on. Uh, if you took more than 10% uh, of your, or 50% of your de your HP in one hit, then you'd have to roll on an injury table. Things like that that are thrown in. Uh, how do different injuries that are persistent on your character affect you? The way you're seen by the world. How do they affect the way you think about your your life i mean if you read uh, stephen king's the gunslinger one of the first things that happens is parts of his hands are taken away from him how does that affect someone who has to pull a trigger you know the whole dark tower saga is affected by that and it's a great story it's a great story arc 
Um, maybe your players could have the same type of effect having to deal with something persistent like that. So just another way to flavor your characters. Then we have Lifted, which just like Lift, I think was a bad name because uh, it doesn't really say much about the characters and what you're going to be playing unless they can carry things or this is a dirty dancing uh, <laughs> RPG. <laughs> then it would make sense, right? Um, it's not. It's superpowers. So I guess the idea is people um, are called Lifted. You know, just it's, it seems like a stretch, a far stretch for an adjective. And uh, I don't know, maybe certain cultures um, would use that word for, for that exclusive meaning more often. Uh, I think maybe if it were in a religious connotation, it might make more sense. Um, but I just don't like the word. Doesn't mean that there's not people that are playing it. The artwork looks neat, it does look like a superhero system but it just doesn't tell me how they got their powers or what the world has to do with it uh, and what you're going to be finding and all that kind of stuff. So I co I commented on the name of the first one we looked at, very similar to this. So I figure I got to say something about it now. Um, primed by Cortex. Don't know what that means, but if you're already playing it, there you go. It says it's supposed to be like Wildcat Stormwatch early uh, image comics. And we have finally an adventure novel, a simple one, Nellie's Nursery. You have a child with supernatural powers and a disturbing doll-sized, uh, or life-sized dollhouse that you have to go through. Seems neat. Seems like something that would make a great Batman, the animated series episode. Um, and I think might have already been one. And I remember something like that with the little doll character. It's pretty awesome. Zan's Adventures has come out with uh, these types of modules and things before out there on DriveThruRPG or the DMs Guild. You can check out what they've created. And uh, if they all tie together, cool. It's been a while since I've seen this particular layout. I'm talking like a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. So uh, it's interesting to see that they're back making stuff and that's cool of them. Reign of Discordia, second edition, which is a little bit confusing because it's a fifth edition inspired game. So you have a two and you have a five, don't get confused. And White Star is another game system that you could utilize. So 10 years after the Stellar Imperium, blah, blah, blah. It's trying to be Starfinder for D&D. &D. Um, give it a go if that sounds like what you need. I'm assuming that there's going to be another Starfinder game coming out from video games soon. If you liked Wrath of the Righteous, uh, I think that the same developer has been giving hints that they're going to be doing that. Um, not the first time this has tried to have been implemented, but there aren't many. And, you know, a lot of people like the 5e rule set, and it should work just fine. Next, we have Return to the Dark Tower, but this time it is the fantasy role playing game. Uh, maybe a year ago, they had this um, Return to Dark Tower game that had the light up stuff and the big expensive uh, toy thing in the front that would spit out gems. Well, this instead has paper, and you can play it as an RPG running through basically the same story as that game, but without the board game part of it. And if there's a book and all this other stuff, maybe you can utilize the tower and all the fancy stuff that came along with it. Uh, that part is up to you. But it is definitely a more inexpensive way to do that. Then for those of you that don't like playing with the GM, this is Shakedown City. And it is uh, a GM-less game of, I'm going to guess, a noir-ish tale. So uh, it's supposed to have pulp uh, storytelling, so it already have all these noir-ish types of uh, stories that it says is inspiration, Sin City especially, Black Dahlia, that kind of fun thing. It's in a zine, so it's not expensive. It says it plays in three to four hours, and you can do it without prep. Sweet. Another adventure for 5e, simple one, not too expensive. It is Halloween themed. Hopefully it will arrive by then. And she says July. So if we start in July, maybe by October it'll be in. And that means that you can get yourself a, uh, a game 
It is a two-page intro with a nine-page adventure, and the rest is all monster stat blocks, so it's not like it's going to take a whole lot to go. And the monsters, it says, are Halloween-y. Now would be the time to start getting Halloween stuff if you want to have it for Halloween. Then we have The Incredible Realms, which is both a book and the STL, so you can see the dragons and all that kind of stuff. You're going to be making portals to different realms. So I was talking about Stranger Things. If you've already caught up on it, maybe this will be your own kind of upside down world you can play in. You got uh, lots of cool looking pieces to go along with it. And there you go. Cultists, like, I don't know what's going on with the Loxodon, but you don't see many minis of that. Trident types, some big old bugs, dragons, and terrain. Just goes on and on with all kinds of neat little things that you can throw in there. So it's mainly a uh, minis campaign, but because it had the book to go along with it, I end up putting, uh, as you can see, the maps and book stuff. 650 bucks. Um, but yeah, <laughs> let's just see what, how much just the book. Do they offer just the book? Uh, yeah, $37. Or sorry, fourteen dollars for just the PDF of the stuff. But then you can get all the uh, resin and other minis to go along with it. Yeesh. Yeah, expensive. Expensive. Then we have uh, a lost message saying that it is a mystery adventure like no other. If you saw Candlekeep Mysteries and you decided you want more, then maybe this one will help you out. Um, human missing in time. Half elf that must find her. A robot orc of some kind who likes to bake cookies. If that brings you in there, cool. Weird, weird stuff going on. I like mystery adventures. And I like it when you don't have to just fight stuff with an axe. That you have a variety of paths to solve. And uh, four bucks. Not too bad. We are into the accessories now. And these are inserts. So I know people... You go buy the broken token ones and all the other stuff. You like the smell of the laser cut wood and all that kind of thing. Well, you can't really theme it. You can't paint it easily. And that's where these cardboard ones come in. So if you have purchased any of these board games already and you want something to help organize it and you would like something that is uh, painted and to go along with the theme, here you go. So you get the card decks and all the other stuff. Looks like they fit sleeved cards. And you can organize your game table with uh, all this cool stuff. For me, I don't have anything other than Black Rose Wars. And Rebirth hasn't come out yet. So I have to see um, how it all goes together. It looks like it's it might still be laser cut MDF. It's totally possible. Um, but I'd love to see how it all ends up going together oh so they they do have the regular black rose wars it might be worth it for me um considering how i was going to start making my own let's see single inserts for 38 dollars. that's about half the price of what a broken token one would cost so yeesh uh that's quite a savings looking uh just quickly at all that stuff so, yeah, for me, I guess I'd get the two for Black Rose Wars. I don't really have any of these other games. I don't know how popular they've been. Bonfire. I know Puerto Rico people have uh, quite a bit of uh, love for that game. And, I mean, it's it's very much a neat accessory. I don't know. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell it to remind me. And I forgot to log in. But if you hit that remind me button, if you needed any of these types of games, it will remind you before the campaign runs out. More accessories. This time it's more for card decks. This one's from GameFound. It's uh, uh, these different deck boxes. As you can see, some of them have the clear tops. And the rest of it is, I think, cardboard. So you can make a little shelf uh, however you like and keep all your stuff together. It fits in these um, game bags if you want to carry around all that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. I don't... Mm, okay. Uh, 
different pieces of art from the look of it are included if you wanted to pick that stuff up. But mainly it's just like a way to keep your Magic the Gathering cards together uh, and to carry them around with you. That's the most I've seen people keeping portable versions of the, these square boxes to carry the cards around. Um, but uh, yeah, you, I guess keep it on the shelf too, that same way. And then for those of you that want to make cards of your own, this is the cocktail card design software. It is not for making cocktails. It is made for making cards. So if you are a designer of some kind and you needed a, a more efficient means of creating cards, then uh, you can check this out and see if it will help you out. Um, not really sure what people use other than InDesign, but if it's faster, easier, works better, then uh, by all means, use this instead. Can't have an episode without dice. So we have some sharp dice, classic dice, all handmade resin. If uh, that's what you're into, you can check out the various colors and sparkles and inclusions and all that kind of stuff. Only four days to go. So watch yourself here. We have moved on to models. Burrows and Badgers, Streets of Newcastle. So these are metal models of badgers and other... Uh, types of anthropomorphic uh, animals. You have crows and other things that you might find, I'm gonna guess, in uh, the cities of England. And uh, hares and weasels and bears and all that kind of crazy stuff, even snakes. A Little more high tech, we have the Dreadnought Armor. These are big robots. And uh, you can see various types as they go. Um, da, 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 da. they want $23 a piece and then $45 gets you both of them so not terribly bad but you have to have the game or a reason why you want it in, in your area so if you have some ideas for it then you're all set then we have Folk Horrors a new collection for whatever game you want to use and uh, these are the creepy things that go bump in the night, especially if you live out in the woods. So instead of Five Nights at Freddy's, it's Five Nights Outside. And then we come up to the Flytrap Drop Trooper. So if you play war games that take place in the future, not a lot of color, so it's a little bit difficult to see how they work. But these are the guys that uh, you would drop out of the plane. Uh, they have skulls on their helmets and different things like that, which is kind of neat. And, yeah. Uh, it would be nice to see a little more colored version, but um, that's not what they gave us. Has nothing to do with Batman. We have the Dark Knight 3D printable statue. This is a 1 to 16th uh, character that is just like a uh, Japanese cultured uh, demon knight, as it were. So something that works for that uh, darkness side. Doesn't necessarily have to be evil, but uh, that seems to be the aesthetic they're going for. Heresy Lab is back, and they've come up with the Heresy Girl 3.5 sci-fi model set. And you can see some folks, like the Dora Milaje, they have the spears. It's kind of a cool look. And then uh, Elsina Hell. Um, with the uh, different uh, weapons and things that you can put on her and characters that would fit pretty well in like Edge Dawnfall or even Warhammer. Um, some of these would fit, although they don't have the same squished look that the Warhammer ones have. They're a little more um, uh, tall, <laughs> a little skinnier, um, a little more accurate to human anatomy. And... Uh, even though humans, I don't think, could carry all this crazy amount of metal and things on them. But there's some neat ideas, some uh, different pieces. Heresy Lab has lots of different options available on their website that would also work well. If you like these ones, you can get more. And then we have some wonderful dungeon landscapes to go along with whatever game you want to play. So here we go. You see uh, some trees, some shattered buildings, different pieces uh, as they get thrown out there. Um... You can create whatever kind of world you want. There's water, there's land, there's forest, there's not. Uh, some interesting pieces, and you get some uh, zoom-ins on the different rocks and hollow areas and canyons and things that you can create. 
So, yeah. If you need terrain, maybe check out what my dungeon is offering. And you can see how this river and dirt paths uh, will go on top. And you can make things happen in uh, a variety of ways and try to keep it fresh. I thought this was interesting. It's from Germany, and they call it Texas Stylized Houses. But there's lots of different types of houses in Texas. <laughs> so I think they're specifically going for a Wild West theme, but not necessarily exclusive to Texas. Maybe that's just how people in Europe uh, very far away have interpreted um, how these would be created. Because just about any boom town or, you know, uh, Wild West ghost town, these things would fit pretty well. So if you're playing Undead uh, or Alive or Deadlands or any of those kinds of games, maybe these will work pretty good for you. Lots of different types of buildings available. Then for the painters out there, we have Lord of the Grove. And this is um, not necessarily a druid but someone that might be a centaur green man hybrid um, you can see they get pretty tall 160 millimeters great opportunity to put them with anything else that is forest related bunch of little bunnies whatever you want to do um, 3d printable so you can make a variety of them i'm doing uh you know i'm working on treants right now and i'm trying to make them look different and uh, I'm trying to use the seasons to make those different looks uh, work out and it's great to have multiple pieces comes with stat blocks all that kind of stuff it's a neat piece um, antlers and, and branches and all that kind of thing but still having that uh, protective pose so if you got a nice diorama in mind this guy might work pretty good then, uh, if you need an African safari, you have the big guys. You have the uh, hippopotami. You have the elephant. You have the uh, different uh, rhinos and other crazy things uh, that you can throw in there. So, yeah. If you uh, need that African adventure, then you're all set. Maybe you want to go to the water, though. And this is Nitya, the Keeper of Eternity which is kind of like a mermaid and a dragon thrown together. So you have her, and then you have her dragon buddy. Um, maybe it'd be a really interesting underwater... Is, are Tritons the name of the, the underwater race in D&D? But a uh, Drake Warden of the underwater realm. That seems to be what's going on there. There's some other characters you can add to it. Uh, very... Um, underworld uh, path to Hades kind of style things that you might find in the abyss so we'll move over to the future again this is project 45x the abandoned biolab terrain so there's some modular pieces that you can include that uh, I mean open lock has a bunch of different ones available in uh, the same style uh, but as you can see here you can throw leds in this one so it's a little bit different than what open lock has 18 previous campaigns i'm going to guess that a lot of them have to do with building these uh, led sci-fi bases and if you haven't seen boy lie hobby time he has had a couple of different uh, recent episodes on how to put uh, LED wires together uh, for his dioramas and miniatures that might be helpful here too. Fantasy Women of the Worlds. So I don't think it's of just Earth, but of different biomes from the look of it. So nature, druid type, then you have magic type. Uh, I guess they'd all be magic, but you know, this one fits a uh, more quirky style of magic, I guess. And then this lady's from the fire areas, so she's the ash world. Um, you could probably make it whatever color scheme you want and vary that up. Oh, an electric lady. So that's kind of neat. If you have a uh, storm cleric, maybe, that would work. And then you have the goth, because you always have to have that from the fallen world, the grim dark, the cosmo world, 
there aren't all worlds in the cosmos. Yeah, it's a little confusing. And then another uh, dark arts companion to go along with the other emo, heavy metal, dark world peoples. Almost done. We have the outpost tower here, which is a ruined tower that uh, you can set up um, or swap out. You have it built and then the ruined one. And so that can change up the way that your uh, your game is played. So there you go. Finally, we have the Asgard Rising group. And these guys are on Patreon all the time. And they create a lot of really high-end miniatures. So how do they get so much money? Well, they've created a Patreon presence beforehand of thousands of people. And they have extremely high-quality stuff. They come out with these Kickstarters um, in addition to the stuff that they do on Patreon. So, you know, you have different goblins and mushroom towers and all that kind of stuff that you might find. All of it is uh, generally themed with Vikings in mind or Viking mythology in mind, that Norse stuff. So these uh, characters here are a little bit outside of that box and uh, seem to be more stylized onto themselves. And maybe that's why they're doing this in the Kickstarter is... Um, because they're branching out and otherwise people would just think that their their stuff is uh for viking campaigns but yeah mushrooms and other things you might find in an underdark really cool different add-on characters that you can attach to it whatever the hell this thing is i guess it's a basilisk trolls of different varieties and uh stone trolls Still filling in that um, Norse uh, mythology inspiration. There's a lot of trolls and things in there. And terrain, as you can see from the different uh, types of ruined castles and things that look pretty cool. But uh, definitely branching out from what they uh, do on their Patreon. And the episode is finally over. You can tell my voice it's starting to go. And so that means I got to head out. Hope you guys have a nice week. I'll catch you on Friday. And, uh, you know, I'm back, I guess, doing full episodes. I would expect Friday because the first is today, tomorrow, whenever you're watching this. Um, then uh, there's a lot of things that end up dropping on the first because that's when people get paychecks. So I would expect Friday to be a pretty busy episode. You guys have a good one.